might say a few words, or you say a few words on your introduction. You have studied in Kiel. Actually, when we got in contact a few weeks ago, I said that I somehow have a slight memory of the name. The name rings some bell, but I don't think that uh, I have kind of influenced you very much in your choice of research later on. You didn't do your PhD in Kiel, and probably also not a bachelor or master thesis with me. So you have developed, so to say, independently some interests that very much overlap with the interests we have in our group. But maybe you can say a few words on your history, uh, your professional history yourself. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, for your kind introduction. Um, yeah, my, na my name is Klaus Grobis. Uh, I studied a uh, diploma business teacher degree at the University of Kiel and uh, graduated uh, in March 2009. And um, it, I was a little bit sort of an outlier back then uh, because I was basically the only one who studied diploma Handelslehrer, this um, the diploma teacher degree, who basically uh, used econometrics as major subject. Um, and back in the days, uh, it was Professor Helmut Herbert who, who was chair of econometrics back then at the University of Kiel. And um, I wrote even my uh, final thesis, uh, my diploma thesis at the University of Kiel in uh, econometrics uh, supervised from Professor Herbert back then. So it was Professor Herberts that had actually quite um, a huge impact on my choices with respect to career and so on. I had many uh, meetings with, uh, with him back in the days, almost every week, and which might have been a little bit annoying to him, but well. Um, but then I was a little bit uh, surprised. So, I mean, I enjoyed econometrics a lot back in the days, and uh, I remember that Professor Herbert said in, in, in one lecture and he used his finger pointer, he said, well, 95% of what you learn at the university, you can forget when you are in your working life, but, but there are 5% that you cannot forget, and this is what you learn here. <laughs> so, so this was quite, quite, uh, quite like, a, let, let's say, like an eye-opening uh, uh, moment somehow. And also, I, I, I have to admit, um, I worked for a couple of years in the industry. I, I worked at the uh, company Klarna, uh, the headquarters in Stockholm, after my graduation for almost two years. Uh, and then I started my uh, doctoral studies in, in finance um, at the University of Vasa. And during my doctoral education, uh, I had many courses in asset pricing, theoretical asset pricing, empirical asset pricing, theoretical corporate finance, empirical corporate finance, and also, of course, econometrics. But I never, no one ever told me about uh, uh, fat tails and uh, the impact that it, that it actually has on the methods that you learn in, in econometrics. So, what, what we did in my doctoral education, we did the generalized method of moments in many different settings. I could derive it in the middle of the night, no, no problem. Uh, we did it back and forth. We did multiple equation models in uh, these this, this seemingly unrelated regressions, uh, in different asset pricing models. We went through the literature, paid a lot of attention to pharma and French pricing models and uh, testing it with different Co um, combinations of test assets and of course that's interesting but it doesn't tell you actually what is what is real life okay I was also into bootstrapping it was uh, encouraged from Professor Herbert there was one one lecture in time series econometrics and we would and we discussed a little bit about bootstrapping and somehow um, I it, it, it caught my attention and then I studied the literature on bootstrapping on, on my own. And I figured out that there's a methodology in bootstrapping that you can use uh, that basically um, gives you the covariance matrix uh, or a robust covariance matrix uh, irrespective of what are the dependency structures. So if, if you use, let's say, blocks bootstraps 
and you select the, the block length randomly, uh, it gives you artificial samples of the, or it should give you artificial samples of the true underlying, underlying data generating process, and you can basically uh, simulate any kind of dependency structures with that. And you get a stationary series as well, because if you select the uh, block lengths randomly using a geometric distribution, yeah, you get uh, randomly selected block length. It ensures stationarity uh, in, the, in, in the time series. And this was basically for me, okay, if, if you use GMM in association with this uh, block bootstrap procedure, you have, a, you have the best methods at hand and you, and you get the correct point estimates. But I figured out that all of that uh, tells you not, not, not how real life is, 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 is functioning. Uh, and then I, uh, I made myself familiar with the literature from Nassim Taleb. I mean, I think most people uh, know, know him and his, his, his books and his, his papers. He, he published a paper in 2020, um, which was published in Nature Physics. Uh, and it was about the, uh, he was modeling the uh, uh, pandemics using power laws and uh, also, and then I remember that, uh, that in his books he was talking about power laws and I, as I got more into this literature I remember that Professor Lux already many years ago before actually Nassim Taleb wrote or published his, his books on that topic, Professor Lux already did a huge amount of research on that topic, right? Uh, so and then I and then I, re I remember that and I, I went through his literature, his public his, his publications, and then I saw many, many different uh, interesting papers on exactly that that topic. Uh, and yeah, I mean this is quite interesting how 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 uh, the world is is quite little <laughs> somehow. And uh, yeah, I mean uh, so so. Uh, um, I, I knew, of course, that Professor Lux is uh, very, has a very high reputation, very rec recognized uh, researcher in economics, uh, actually around the world, uh, I can say. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's maybe also one of the reasons that uh, Professor Lux already did many years ago, something that people nowadays uh, start with, basically. So, so uh, that was... Uh, very, very interesting, and yeah, I had actually a couple of, of, of lectures, I, I remember, it, it, I think one of the lectures was international financial markets, I think, exactly, yeah. yeah, exactly, and I remember the, the lecture was, uh, it was super interesting, it was the first lecture in, in English, for, uh, and it, it, it was actually the first time when I actually learned English, because um, all the other lectures were, were, were given in, 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 in German. And we had in this uh, lecture that there, that there were maybe, I don't know, 150 students, but there was one student who was English speaking and we had the whole lecture in, in English then. <laughs> that, was, that was a very good experience because it prepared myself, of course, for my exchange studies at the University of Stockholm that, that followed then uh, in the term uh, af afterwards. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, of the master program, which is completely taught in, in English. Probably, of course, we we'll also teach it in English in Warsaw. Yes. Yeah, yes. the world is small. I have been once, uh, uh, what is the term in, in the Finnish system? An opponent in a doctoral yeah. thesis. I think I wrote you that. Yes. One of your colleagues, and I checked he's still at the University of Warsaw. So now I have two contacts to Warsaw University. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That is also this burnt Pape. And uh, I was back in the days, I, I was wondering, or I was a little bit surprised uh, because uh, so as far as I have understood, Bernd was uh, is actually a physicist and he uh, wrote his PhD thesis in statistics. And uh, then uh, I think my, my supervisor told me that uh, Professor Lux was the uh, opponent to, to Bernd Pape back in the days. Uh, and it was actually not, not that long ago. I, I started with, with my doctoral studies in November 2012. And it must have been a couple of years. It's been shortly before, yeah. 
about yeah. this time, yeah, about 10, 12 years ago, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I can check it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it was a nice experience because it's much more formal, the uh, procedure for the defense of the thesis than in Germany. In Germany, you come to a small room with three professors and maybe two of your colleagues who want to see how it works, and then you speak for a few minutes, you get a few questions, and that's it. Okay. No formalities, but in uh, Finland, of course, it, I think it's all in all the Nordic countries. It's yeah. much more formal. They have fitted me a suit with a cylinder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For that purpose. Yeah, that is true. It's it's a very very formal procedure, and also the the education is. Is a little bit different. I think it, it was like some some years ago. It was still like in in Germany that you uh, that people wrote, wrote monographs, right, as the dissertation project. But here in the Nordic countries, it is already many years ago that we have to write papers that have been that should have been published uh, in journals. Uh, and of course, uh, it takes accordingly on average, I think, seven years uh, for people to graduate in in financial economics, for instance. So we move more and more towards that, but still the possibility exists to write a monograph. But it's very rare, maybe one out of 10 or 20 students, most write papers. Yeah. And at Vasa, your position is that of a professor, assistant, associate, or lecturer? Yeah, I mean, I have been, since January this year, I was promoted to associate professor. Uh -huh. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and uh, I am uh, next year. After next year that follows, uh, I might be um, evaluated for for professor uh, ship. And yeah, I'll be because I'm I'm on the tenure tenure track, luckily, and um, that's uh, yeah I'm happy about it. But I'm now now already very happy. I mean, everything that follows now is just bonus bonus. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm very satisfied uh, with with my position right now and. A great career. I'm and do you speak Finnish meanwhile? No, no, not at all. <laughs> Actually, since since all the teaching is in English, anyways, and uh, we have a, I think fifty percent or maybe even more of our staff members are from all over the world, because financial economics is such a international uh, environment. Uh, all conferences are in English, and and so so um, many many uh, staff members are English speaking. And uh, moreover, I learned Swedish before already, uh, and so um, I, uh, I here in in, in Barca, uh, about half of the population is uh, Swedish speaking as well, and Swedish is actually also uh, um, in, in official language here in in okay. Finland. So you get around, yeah. I yeah. I think Pape, Pape could speak Finnish well, but he has a Finnish uh, girlfriend or wife right? yes. at that time at least. Yeah. Yes, yes. Even give lectures in Finnish, he told me. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he gives lectures. I, I, I had one exam, uh, I took one exam, it was econometrics, uh, and Bernd was the lecturer then, uh, also for, for doctoral studies. Uh, it was, couple, yeah, it was 10 years ago, because the uh, chair was on uh, research leave, and then Bernd was supposed to give the lectures in econometrics, and um, um, yeah, he actually, we can, one couldn't choose between English, German, Finnish, and Swedish when writing the exam. So this was actually quite funny. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, one of my daughters is learning Finnish. She speaks some Finnish, and I know from her how difficult it is. <laughs> yes. So, yes, it's a, it's a very, yeah, it's a very different language. Uh, it's more like uh, hung, Hungarian or Estonian. They are like, uh, it's... Um, it's not a Germanic uh, origin like 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 uh, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, German. They are, have the same sort of uh, origin uh, of of language, uh, but but uh, Finnish is is very different from any other language. It's a, it's it's not that uh, easy. But of course, if you take Finnish courses, yeah, I I started to take one Finnish class, but due to my workload, I gave up. <laughs> and and but maybe at some point. I might give, I might take some Finnish class. But most of the Finnish can communicate in English. Yes, yes, yes. Surprisingly, it, it, they are very strong uh, in, in English here, or actually in all Nordic countries, uh, also in, in, in Swedish or no in Norway. They are very, uh, very good uh, in English, I have to, I have to say.
Okay, I think now we have reached a stable audience. Um, um, Christina Satterhoff and Tanasan are the ones who are mostly interested in multifactor modeling. Tanasan actually did his master thesis with Calbe, uh, Laurent Calbe, a direct uh, pupil of uh, Mandelbrot. So here we have a direct lineage, so to say, coming from the master. And uh, the other participants, we have a number of research topics. So, for example, we are also kind of doing research on agent-based models. Uh, that was also the, the content of this thesis that I, uh, that I, where I participated in the defense in Borsa. So that's my contact point with your colleague, and we are dealing with network models of systemic risk, things like that. So we have a number of topics, but um, we always had a few colleagues who were pursuing in their research and PhD thesis also uh, multi-factor applications and extensions of the original model. And Tanasan and Christina are doing that, besides myself. So, yeah, yeah we are happy to have you. Thank you. So, I would give you the floor. I think I have to allow you to use the screen. That should now be possible. But well, it, hopefully it works. Yeah. Once again, thank you uh, for letting me presenting uh, my current uh, working paper uh, entitled A Multifractal Model of Asset Invariances. So, uh, for the motivation part, uh, why is it important to explore asset market uncertainty where the variance or the volatility, which is simply the, the, the square root of it, is a key variable for understanding market fluctuations. And first of all, analysts need, to, need a, an accurate forecast of, of volatility for, for instance, risk management or portfolio allocation. And on the other hand, monetary policymakers, uh, they also are interested in uh, forecasting variances. And the, uh, as pointed out in the uh, paper from Segnon and, and Lux, that uh, the financial crisis from 2008, 2009 uh, has shown that uh, it is uh, important uh, to uh, for for policymakers uh, to to conduct uh, effective monetary policy. So uh, now you may wonder, well, what's the problem with uh, gauge models that are often used uh, to model volatilities? I myself was supposed to learn many of these gauge models uh, during my uh, graduate uh, studies at the University of Kiel. Well. First of all, Gartsch models, they don't explain uh, what makes the bell curve uh, vibrate, the, in the innovation process. Uh, then, as pointed out from Mandelbrot, they are complicated. Uh, to say much with little, this should be the goal of, of good science, but most established financial models say little with much. And then the third point is, uh, if they don't work, they are often fixed. Uh, we know they are T-gauge models, they should fix the, the uh, effect of, of uh, bad news, that the, the, that the uh, variance is, is more pronounced when the uh, innovation process is negative. There are E-gauge models uh, that are also designed for, for uh, testing the effect of, of uh, bad news, of more, if they are more pronounced. Uh, so th there are many different gauge models for that whole literature actually on that topic. Um, but uh, according to Mandelbrot, uh, people stu still lose money with, with these models, and this should come as no surprise. What I think is the, is the, is the most is the, is the major problem with Gartsch models is that the parameter estimates are sample specific. So if you take the S&P 500, if, if you take the last five years or three years for the S&P 500, and you run a Gartsch model like a Gartsch 1:1 as, as a benchmark model. And then you compare the estimates with a different sample, let's say 10 years earlier, and you use again uh, five, five years of data, you will see that you get very different estimates. Uh, moreover, if you then use, let's say, you use instead of the, you use one of these fixes, yeah, you use not the normal distribution, but you use the, let's say, the T distribution with five degrees of freedom in order to ensure that the uh, theoretical first and second moment uh, converge then you might see you get, again, different estimates for the same sample. And if you then select th that the uh, model should choose the most accurate t-distribution, which, uh, which maybe have 
two to three degrees of freedom, yeah, which, actually, which actually might tell you already, well, the innovation process has, has an undefined uh, uh, variance, well, then you get, again, different point estimates. Yeah, you see these, these parameter estimates of, of Gauge models are, are very sample-specific and model-specific. So the purpose of, of this study is to propose a framework for modeling the second moment of financial assets based on realized variances. Now you may wonder, well, why, why realized variances? Well, because uh, according to Anderson et al., it's a highly efficient estimator of the underlying true return variation process. And moreover, according to Wang and Yang, they argue that a realized uh, volatility-based approach is able to uncover volatility features that conventional guard type models fail to reveal. So what's the contribution of uh, this study or the intended contribution? Well, first, the study contributes to the literature on modeling uncertainty in financial markets by proposing a multifractal model for asset variances and testing the invariance phenomenon across different time scales. Second, recent literature tests the power law null hypothesis for volatility processes of various asset markets using realized variances, respectively realized volatilities, and finds strong evidence for Parisian tales for the volatility of stable cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and the variances for gold, crude oil, S&P 500 and the British pound US dollar ex exchange rate. And this is actually my, my own studies that have been recently uh, published. So the current study ex extends this research by proposing a model that could generate the underlying stochastic uh, process of these uh, realized asset market variances. And in this, in this uh, regard, Mandelbrot argues in his book uh, that a model, a model must work two ways. That means forward and backward. Forward means that we should be able to construct artificial price charts from the fractal seeds. And backwards means that we should, that we should be able to take raw price data and uh, analyze the model based upon the key parameters. So in my earlier published research, I did the backwards analysis. Okay, I, I, I took data on Bitcoin, stable coins, uh, stable cryptocurrencies, uh, gold, oil, S&P 500, and so on. And I was running uh, the power law model using maximum likelihood and tested the model using a goodness of fit test. And for all of these, these uh, realized variances, I could not reject the power law null hypothesis. What I do now is, okay, I'm interested in the, the forward-looking uh, forward model. I want to uh, find a model that basically is able to generate these processes. And what are the key parameters, you may wonder? Well, again, I follow Mandelbrot here. The key parameters are uh, the power law exponent, and the Hearst exponent, but we will come back to that later. Uh, in Mandelbrot's, uh, or the, 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 the key issue in financial markets, according to Mandelbrot, is discontinu discontinuity, and this is measured by the, or captured by the power law exponent, and the memory, or the, the dependency, and this is captured uh, by the Hearst ex exponent. So these are the two key parameters, and I evaluate the model uh, based upon these two key parameters. Third, the third contribution or the third intended contribution is, uh, well, uh, following Mandelbrot, Fischer and Calvet, uh, there is a strand of literature that has emerged that proposed different multifractal cascades for modeling asset returns. And there is a huge amount of literature and uh, a, a literature review is provided uh, in the uh, paper from Signal and Lux. That is, I think, nowadays uh, published uh, as a, in, a, in, a, in a handbook for multifractal modeling, is, if I remember correctly, in 2016. And also Professor Lux, uh, of course, uh, uh, proposed a model based upon Markov switching, uh, as far as I have uh, understood. So it's also uh, for, for modeling the multifractal cascade. 
So the, the current literature uh, extends this uh, multifra multifractal framework to model directly the realized variance processes of financial uh, markets. And the concept of realized variance or volatility has been developed from Andersen uh, et al. as an alternative measure for the, var for the variability of uh, financial prices. And it's considered as a highly efficient non-parametric estimator. And the methodology is, I think, quite straightforward. Once one has uh, read the uh, last the last book from from Mandelbrot, uh, Mandelbrot, the misbehavior of, of markets. A very interesting book. Book I read it nowadays uh, a couple of times already. Uh, and that's basically. The whole idea. Yeah, you have uh, you have two processes that you multiply with each other. The the one process is a Brownian motion process, and the other process is used for deformation of time. So uh, time you can think of time. If time is one, there's not much happening, and the whole process is driven by the normal distribution or by the Brownian motion process. But you can deform time if if, if time is, let's say, five, there's a lot of going on in the market. So you, 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 there's hectic and, and a lot of turnover and it, it has an effect on the, you leverage basically the uh, outcome of the Brownian motion process. Whereas if, you, um, if the time is, let's say, 0 0.3, you, um, the market is, let's say, calm, and it has also an effect of the outcome. You have, let's say, a lower return if you multiply uh, the return generating process of the, of the Brownian motion with the multi, multifractal cascade. So that's, that's the basic idea. And I took this, this picture here from, from Mandelbrot's book. So, and of course, the, uh, the whole theory beyond that, that modeling is, of course, uh, quite, let's say, quite a right. Uh, in mathematics, but in his book he gives a cartoon, yeah? so he, a simplified version of the original model that was proposed uh, of the, in 1997. So in his 2008 book he uh, argues, okay, the multifractal process for generating asset returns may be given by this expression here, so you have yt, well that's the that's the uh, multifractal return process, and that is given by the multiplicative cascade or multifractal cascade at time t times the Wiener process, respectively uh, IID, normal, normal distribution. So, and Mandelbrot argues that the, uh, the multiplicative cascade or the multifractal cascade is of major importance for the process, and what we will see is that is true. So, uh, in my paper, I'd like to follow uh, Mandelbrot and use binomial bending of time. And I start as a benchmark model. I use uh, binomial bending of time using a probability of 0.6 versus 0.4. So that's basically in his book, he, he motivates this because this binomial bending corresponds to um, what you see in nature. For instance, how gold is distributed across the uh, continents. Yeah, and we will see that this is a very powerful uh, model, even though he denotes it as cartoon. I also would like to consider more extreme time deformations. Yeah, so I consider a time deformation where I use a, a probability of 0.65 versus 0.35 for constructing the multiplicative cascade and a more moderate time deformation using a, a probability of 0.55 versus 0.45. Then I construct uh, the, re the weekly variance by just squaring each element in this y vector and summing up five consecutive non-overlapping elements as described here in this uh, e equation. Yeah? And this z vector, it, it is at 1024, it has 1024 entries and each entry is the corresponding weekly variance for each point in time. So I need, as you see here, I, I, I need 5,120 observations uh, in order to come up with a, a 
time series vector of 1024 weekly uh, variance observations. And what I do then is, well, I use uh, this, this CT, the, the uh, vector for the multiplicative cascade is always the same, but then I use thousand different vectors uh, having normal drawings from the normal di distribution and multiply it with the uh, constant multiplicative cascade. And so I get basically, I get thousand of these uh, Z vectors and W uh, denotes uh, the uh, weekly variance. So in, in, in order to, uh, so I have basically, uh, if you can see it here on the, on the whiteboard, I have basically a huge matrix here, yeah, where I have uh, each, each column vector here is one ZW1 vector, the second ZW2, and so on. And the last one here, we have the uh, ZW1000, yeah, 1000 uh, time series vectors giving me the, the, the weekly variances. So then in order to uh, investigate the discontinuity, uh, I uh, in terms of, of, of tail properties, I estimate for each single time series vector the corresponding power law exponent. Yeah, I use the power law function here and uh, I follow the literature using a maximum likelihood uh, estimation. There are different approaches. There are log log. Some people use log log regressions, other people they use the hill plot. And then you uh, can select basically the, the saddle point as the optimum, uh, but the literature has argued that uh, the maximum likelihood estimator is uh, most, most uh, reliable. So the, the, the thing is to get for, 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 each, for each vector yeah, here, you get a, a whole set of uh, maximum likelihood estimators. Yes, please. I see here's a hand from Professor Lux. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have one question. Uh, the, 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 the line was quite interrupted here. Could you just... Oh, sorry for that. Uh, I try once more. Um, I, think to re I think I remember that there should be some theoretical results on what alpha should be for uh, the binomial and the log normal cascade. Maybe it goes to infinity for the binomial cascade. I don't remember. For the log normal cascade, it should be fine, right? And, and it should be possible to determine. I think that's part of the papers or some other papers. Okay, okay. So you, you mean that the uh, power law exponent alpha for, for each of these time series should, uh, should be uh, infinite? No, it should, it, it, there should be some theoretical knowledge. And if I remember correctly, for the binomial model, it would be infinite for the log normal model. It would be finite. Uh, it's something that Mandelbrot keeps a bit under the carpet because it does not fit with his other publications. But I think he had some some results on that, uh, and the results maybe, if I remember correctly, might apply to an infinite number of cascades. That's I think we had thirteen, which is certainly pre-asymptotic. So the question then would be in how far these asymptotic results could apply. On. And I remember also that I sometimes did similar analysis checking what the alpha would be if you estimate it, and you get things that are far away from the theoretic results. Okay, okay, yeah. So um, I was, I think I read once about this issue, or I mean, not, not, um, 
very detailed, but I was, I was thinking, okay, um, actually you can use any length of, of the binomial cascade. You could basically generate an infinite length of, let's say I use uh, only, only five bendings. If I use bootstrapping, blocks boot, bootstrapping, I can use this cascade of, of five iterations and create uh, 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 infinite time lengths that has the same properties like these uh, having uh, only five bendings, um, which is stationary because uh, if, if, you, if you use these uh, random, random uh, block length generator. So I was thinking about it uh, already a little bit, um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I was I was thinking about that or already. But then I was thinking about the the, the, the bootstrapping that you can any time series you can create uh, um, you can have you you can choose some thoracic properties of some fractal process and you can make um, an infinite length of of the uh, same of the process that has the same properties and you can even get infinite number of samples having the same properties and um, so yeah I mean but yeah I, I, I will have that in mind I will have that in mind and I, I need to probably to uh, have a closer look on that uh, issue yeah yeah thank you thank you so much for the for the comment yeah um, so uh, yeah, I, 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 I measure the uh, this discontinuity here um, using the, the uh, power law function, using the, I, I estimate the power law function for, for each of these uh, thousand uh, vec time series vectors. Um, and then I make use of the uh, kolmogorov smirov distance and the uh, goodness of fit test um, from Clauset et al. So that's basically um, a test that, that tests the, the, the plausibility of the power law hypoth hypothesis for, for, for each of these uh, uh, time series vector. Yeah, and this gives me then at the same time the uh, optimum for the uh, minimum value of the variance uh, and all uh, 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 observations above that minimum value, they are governed by the power law process, whereas the other um, observations below that critical uh, order that ex that minimum uh, value are then governed by a different process. So that's usually how, how people look, look at it. Um, to explore the dependency characteristics, I, I use the Hurst, Hurst exponent uh, as opposed to correlation-based metrics because Mandelbrot points out that the uh, Hurst, ex Hurst exponent, um, you can use it for, for any data. It doesn't require any distribution uh, assumption. Uh, so I use the rescaled range statistic, uh, which is given here by this expression. And as you see here, uh, now you might, some of you might wonder, okay, why do I choose 1,024 observations in the weekly variance series? Well, I, I, I use it because it must be dividable by, by, by four so that I can implement uh, these uh, RS, uh, this, this uh, rescaled range statistic. So for, for, for each component of, of k here, I get a different uh, test, uh, I, I get a different value here. So and, uh, what we have to do actually is, okay, the uh, rs for k is equal with constant c times k to the power of h. So that's a, that's a power law. I have to take the, uh, I get basically here six, or was it six, yeah, six different uh, values, and then I have to make a log-log regression in order to get the estimate for the uh, first exponent. And I do this thousand times for each, uh, for each sample. Uh, then I also uh, want to have a look on the monthly series. So, and in the same manner, I use again 5,120 observations of, my, uh, of the multifractal uh, model. And then I sum up 20, uh, consecu uh, 20 consecutive non-overlapping elements and square them, of course, in order to get the, uh, the realized monthly uh, variances. And the vector is, of course, smaller. Uh, that's, that's then a 256 by 1,000 
uh, uh, matrix, basically, what I get. And then again, for each of these time series vectors, I, I do the same thing, like I did for the weekly uh, data series. Um, and here are the results. So using a, a binomial banding with a probability 0.6, this is, this is what I get. Yeah? Um, that's the YT process, and I just grab the, the first I plot here the first uh, uh, time series vector, and here I use monthly data. So I, I, I plot the series for the corresponding monthly data, and I use the first uh, uh, time series vector here. Here I plot the results for using a more moderate binomial banding using a probability of 0.55. Yeah, you see, if you see the scale on the uh, y axis, yeah, you see it's, it's, it goes until 120. Earlier it went until 600. Yeah? So you see it's more moderate. Yeah? Uh, and you see here 0.65. Yeah? So now the scale goes until 2700. Uh, uh, so it's, you see a small difference in the uh, changing the probabilities for the binomial bending has a huge impact on the corresponding multifractal cascade. Uh, here I plot uh, the the S&P, the, the, the realized variance of the S&P 500 against uh, one simulated uh, from the multifractal model. And now I'm wondering, what do you think? Which, which variance is the corresponding variance of the S&P 500? Yeah, exactly. You cannot distinguish. It, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's what I, why I uh, said in the beginning that this cartoon from Mandelbrot is very powerful. You, it's so close to the real data that you, that you cannot even say any, any, any longer what is what here. So, and the point is, of, of course, uh, this is just the first time series vector here that I, did, that I randomly, I could, take, I could have taken any other as well, but for the S&P 500, I have only one, one realized series of, of, of the realized variance. I, I have only one. Uh, but here, I, this model tells me how it could, like, could, could look like at, at, different, universe, at different universes. Yeah, so so that's, that's basically um, the benefit here. I can get, I have the same process here, but I can draw different simulated time paths. So next, uh, Again, I use now, uh, I go back to weekly data, I just used here monthly data to illustrate uh, how, how, how well that model performs actually. Uh, but, but now I use weekly data because I have more observations, uh, but the results, of course, they are the same. Uh, but here we have maybe a, a little bit um, more, uh, let's say, the, uh, it, it, I have simply more, more, more data points, so the, the um, how, how, you, how, how you call it, it's, it, it, it maybe gives a better, a, a cleaner picture, a cleaner picture. So, so here uh, I use again as benchmark model the uh, probability 0.6 for the binomial banding and weekly data. And what we see here already is that uh, irrespective of, of which alpha, due to you see there's a, alpha is distributed a, a across a certain, a certain, it has a certain distribution, but you see that the Hurst exponent Irrespective if you take an, an alpha of 2, if the model produces an alpha of 2 or 3, the Hurst exponent varies in the same manner. So that's what I think is, is already an interesting finding. And you also see there's a, there's a mean, there's a mean for alpha and the mean for the Hurst exponent. So each, each model produces, as, has, it pr produces certain characteristics of the, of, of the key uh, metrics here. Yeah, so this, this is what I think is interesting. Uh, let me just take this here away. So what we can say now, or what we, what we can do is, okay, we can say, all right, we have the uh, power law ex exponent alpha, and we have a distribution here for that, for that guy. And we can also, we, 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 can, have the, we can have a look on the empirical data, uh, how much uh, 
are here in the, let's say, let's say you want to have 95% or 90% probability, and then we can say, okay, if uh, realization or uh, of a time series is outside of this 95% uh, interval, it's probably not a part uh, of, of that model. So we can test basically empirical data using the uh, distribution of generated alphas and Hurst exponents. So that's, that's basically the idea. Um, next, what we see here is that the, uh, depending on the, we see an, a, a, a negative association between the power law exponent and the percentage of observations that are governed by the power law. So we see here, if we move, if we have a process that has a power law exponent of, of two, yeah, which, is, which is close to infinite uh, 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 mean, uh, we see that half of the observations are uh, governed by, by this power law process, whereas if we move, if the, if the model produces a power law exponent of between 3 and 3.5, uh, we see that only less than 10% of the sample observations are governed by, by a power law process. The same is reflected in the, uh, in the maximum uh, amount of consecutive time uh, units in the power law regime. So this may be something that I need to explain also a little bit more. Uh, let's say what, what I did here is actually okay. I say, all right, we have, we have a process here and we, we know we have certain, a certain uh, pattern here going, pattern going on here and we know that whenever this can be anything, it can be a variance or uh, volatility, anything. Uh, so what our model tells us is, okay, if we exceed a certain value of, of, uh, of our, uh, let's say, z-variable here, of our real, um, realization, then this, this part of the observations are governed by the power law. But it, the, the, uh, the model does not tell us um, how, how the observations are distributed in the time series because that's a different story. So uh, let's say if it's randomly distributed, if the power law observations are randomly distributed in the uh, time series, yeah, we, can, we can test if, if they are randomly distributed or if, they are, if, if, if there's a dependency, if, if, if there are um, a large number of, of consecutive observations uh, um, in the power law um, um, regime, then it's obviously unlikely that it's uh, evenly distributed. So then we have a dependency going on. And this, and this is exactly what we see, of course, because we know that financial time series cluster, that the volatility is clustering, and we can test this also implicitly by um, taking the, in, in each time series, uh, we, 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 we estimate, okay, what's the maximum uh, time length that, that, that we are in the power law regime. And this is basically what we see here. So if we have, if the model gives us a predicted a value for the power law uh, um, exponent that is, that is close to two, then we have between, let's say, 25 and, and, and 40 observations uh, that are maximum, uh, maximum length of observations that are in the power law regime, whereas if we have a power law exponent of 3.5, then only, we have only up to five as a maximum uh, observations that are governed in the power law regime that are consecutive. So that's a different way to have a, to have a look on it and a different way to test for dependency, actually. So uh, now we have the results, and this is maybe the uh, most interesting. So the, uh, we have, again, the benchmark model that has a, that has a binomial bending of 0.6, and we want to uh, we want to investigate, want to explore uh, the other models against the uh, benchmark benchmark model. So again, we we use we have weekly data. Um, we see that uh, the distribution uh, that the, that the uh, point estimate so the the, the mean is 2.61. So 2.61 is the uh, mean for the power exponent generated for uh, binomial bending using 0.6 and weekly data. And we know also that 5% uh, uh, are 
are here, yeah, they, they have a value of, of less than uh, 2.09 and 5% that are here on, in, in, in this area, they have a value that is larger than 3.29. So this is what the empirical data gives us. We can also have a look on the, on the standard deviation, just the standard deviation of, our, uh, of the mean value is uh, 0.38, yeah. Uh, and if we use, uh, the, if we have a look on the on the Hurst, Hurst exponent, so we see that the Hurst exponents are also distributed, have a certain distribution, and here we have uh, the mean value is is 0.50, uh, 0.46, and we have then here uh, five percent here and there, we have 0.51. And here we have uh, 0.39. Yeah? So again, we can now evaluate other models against uh, these, these two key metrics here. So uh, if we use now uh, monthly data, what do we get here? So we get the point estimate. If we, if we just take the mean, uh, the, mean uh, the mean is estimated as 2.87 which is close to 2.61, but not exactly the same. And the standard deviation is 0.62. So if we, of course, we see now already uh, without uh, uh, using a calculator, we know that the uh, are highly significant, that the, uh, that the alphas, that the distributions here, the, the, the mean values are highly significant. So that's, that's not a noise. We have here a clear, uh, a clear distribution for, for the alphas and for the Hurst exponents. So uh, now we can test, okay, does the monthly data generate a different uh, process than the weekly data? So, and obviously this 2.86 is within the probability uh, of, of this 95% probability interval. So we cannot reject the hypothesis. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, about the Hurst coefficient, um, this is a definition of the Hurst coefficient where 0.5 means no correlation. Yes. Because there are different definitions possible. Yes. Which then means that most of the estimates for most of the simulations are smaller than 0.5, are anti correlated. Uh, once again, so, so 0.5. for the Hurst coefficient, for your simu that's for the simulations. Uh, yes, yes. Then most of the simulations indicate anti-correlation in the Hurst coefficient. E it, yeah, and we, we see the, the median is 0.46 and the, yeah. and the mean is 0.46. So the median and mean are, are the same. But if we test uh, the, if you test the, the uh, the difference between 0.5 and 0.46, it's less than two standard deviations. So we, ca we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the, um, that the mean of the Hurst exponent is statistically 0.5. Yeah. But if the out time degradation, I would expect something like 0.6 or 0.7 for the binomial or log normal model. So is this the effect of time aggregation already? that you use weekly, that means five, the sum of five observations and monthly aggregates? If we... If we I find this a bit surprising. Yeah, if we, if we see the, the, the data for the monthly, it's even closer. So it's, the, the, it's hardly to distinguish between the uh, monthly uh, and the, and the uh, weekly data, because the monthly data has, has, has a mean of 0.46 as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's statistically the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but without time aggregation, I mean, it, if I simply gen generate the multifactor model of acid returns according to Mandelbro, that typically has something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, depending on what the p parameter is. Yeah, yeah, that's. So, also, I never did it myself, but I'm wondering that this is already lost if you aggregate five observations because it has long term dependence. So, I would have expected that it survives to understand. Yeah, yeah. We will, I think we, we, will, we will come to that if we, uh -huh. if, we, okay. if we discuss the other models. We will come back to that issue. Yeah, thank you, thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is basically uh, uh, the result that we get for the uh, 0.6 binomial bending uh, weekly and monthly data. So we can, uh, if we compare these, these two tables, we uh, cannot say, um, so we, we would basically uh, say that the monthly um, model produces the same uh, metrics like the weekly data, and that's invariance. Yeah, so that's that invariance. And this is actually also something interestingly, what I've, what I've found in one of my papers for the S&P 500, for the S&P 500, when I use daily data for the sample from 90, covering from 1957 until 2020, roughly, I used daily data and I used the uh, Parkinson uh, range uh, estimator, realized uh, volatility range estimator. And I figured out that the power law exponent is 2.58 for daily data. If I use monthly data, and I, and I use this approach that, that we have here as well, that I sum up basically the squared uh, end of day using the, the end of day closing, closing prices and square, the, square up the 20 uh, consecutive squared returns, which is a completely different uh, estimator compared to the intraday estimator from Parkinson, right? But I get for the monthly data exactly the same point estimates, 2.58. So, and this is basically con confirmed here for, for a different time frequency because here we compare weekly with monthly data. In the, in the real life data, I use daily and monthly data and I get the same power law exponent, which is, I think, interesting. But um, yeah, so uh, next um, we have, uh, I would like, again, I use the benchmark model 0.6, binomial bending 0.6, and I compare it with weekly data, binomial bending 0.55. So what we see here is the point estimate, the average or the, the expected power law exponent for that model is 3.72. And that's outside of the 95% probability interval for the alphas for the benchmark model, right? So that's a different model. This model has different characteristics. And here also we see what Professor Lux uh, already referred to we see here that the Hurst exponent is statistically uh, significantly larger than 0.5. So we, here we have persistency. This, this model produces a, 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 a different persistency uh, in the variance. So we have a, the, 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 the mean of the Hurst exponent is 0.67, and that's uh, far away, far away uh, from, from uh, 0.46, given that the standard deviation is only 0.3. So that's, that's far away. So that's a completely different model, but we, we, we will see that also uh, in the different slide here. This is just the tables. We will also see the, the corresponding figure. Um, now we, we would like to compare the, uh, the benchmark model with the uh, time def with more extreme time deformation. Okay, now, now we have more extreme uh, market going on here. Uh, we will use binomial bending 0.65 65 and weekly data. So what you see here is the the average the average power law exponent is 2.12. That's slightly marginal significant, right? It's it's but it's close to to the critical value here. Yeah, so that's close to the but we see that the Hurst exponent suggests anti-persistence. So the the average Hurst exponent is 0.13 and that's also far away from uh, 0.46, which is what the benchmark model suggests. And it's far away from, from the 95% uh, probability interval here. So again, we can say that's a different model because both metrics should be inside these uh, probability intervals, right? But here we see, okay, the alpha is, it's very close to the uh, critical value here so that we would reject the model, but Given the 5% uh, uh, probability, we, we don't do that. Um, but the Hurst exponent is clearly far away. So this, if we use this more extreme time deformation, it produces um, a more extreme, more extreme events, yeah? because uh, the lower the power law exponent, the larger is the uh, deviation. It, it produces more, more extreme events, and it produces more anti-persistence. Anti
Now again, let's 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 go back to the uh, we can now we evaluate the benchmark model using weekly data with real life data using weekly variances for the exchange rate British pounds against US dollar, Bitcoin, crude oil, and the S&P 500. Um, well, what we see here is okay, the alphas, the the uh, estimated uh, power law exponents, all of them are significant, of course, because the, we, we see here that the p-values, apart from the S&P 500, but we, we can, uh, if we use monthly data, the, uh, I, I think it's, it's close to, to 0.95, the uh, p-value for the S&P 500 for the, weekly, for the monthly variance. But here, if we have the weekly variance, the p-value uh, is surprisingly uh, less than 5%. But let's neglect disregard from, from that issue. Uh, well, what we see is that the power law exponents are between 2.17 for the S&P 500 and 2.95 for Bitcoin. So which means all of them are in the 95% probability yeah, for power law exponents generated with binomial bending of 0.6. This, so it's, it, it's, once again, it, it suggests that this simple benchmark model can produce the variation of power law exponents that we observe in these four important uh, asset market variances. Uh, then we see on the, if we go to the move to the Hurst exponent, we see the Hurst exponents vary between 0.33 for Bitcoin and 0.50 uh, for the exchange rate British pounds to US dollar. So if we Go move to the uh, upper part of the table, we see the Hurst exponents vary between 0.39 and 0.51. So all of them, uh, apart from Bitcoin, are in this interval of Hurst exponents produced from the benchmark model. What about Bitcoin? Well, we see that Bitcoin, even though it's, it is not in the 95% of, of Hurst exponents generated by the benchmark model, but it's still in the support. It's still in the support because we see that the minimum value that the benchmark model generates is a Hertz exponent of 0.3266. And Bitcoin's Hertz exponent is 0.3334. So it's still inside the support uh, of the model. And when we test, when we test the difference between uh, Bitcoin's Hertz exponent of 0.3334 and the 95% uh, or the 5% the, 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 uh, critical value of, let's say, 0.39, 30, uh, 22, uh, 23, we could not reject the null hypothesis that uh, Bitcoin's uh, first exponent is here somewhere. We could not reject the null hypothesis. So again, what, what does it mean? It means that our model, that the benchmark model can price all the variances with respect to these two metrics here. Yeah, yeah please, please, I see there's a hand. Um, yes, can you please tell us what, how did you compute these weekly variances? Did you use uh, some intraday data or you sum over the squared daily returns? I, I used squared uh, daily returns. I, I used the... Uh, the uh, multiplicative cascade, and uh, the multiplier with a normal distribution in order to retrieve uh, multifractal data. And then I interpret this data as a daily return process, and then I just square up the uh, observations, five consecutive observations, which is then my weekly variance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, then we have here uh, to illustrate, I said that I would like to illustrate the results. Here I have, I have added this figure in the paper after I send it because I have, I, um, have uh, made a small revision. But this is just one, one, one figure that I added here. So here we see basically the, each cloud. But what you see here is what, the, what each of the model generates. So we see here the, the uh, cloud of, of, of uh, green dots. That's the uh, binomial, this is used based on the binomial bending with very extreme, it's 
with the extreme time deformation. And we see the blue cloud of, of blue dots is generated by uh, the model using, by the Vanishtag model, using the binomial bending of 0.6. And the uh, red cloud above is generated by uh, using the binomial bending uh, of more, a uh, moderate uh, uh, of 0.55. And what we see here is, here I illustrated uh, where are the uh, corresponding uh, the vector of, of Hurst exponent, Paolo exponent, where are they located here in this Hurst exponent, Paolo exponent uh, uh, space. And you see that clearly uh, all of those asset, asset markets, uh, all, all of them, all of the variances are located uh, by what is produced from this, uh, from the benchmark model. Uh, to conclude, what can we say? So we have the, the benchmark model using binomial bending of 0.6, uh, generates asset variances uh, exhibiting on average a power exponent and Hurst exponent of alpha 2.61 and H of 0.46. 90% um, of the generated power exponents and Hurst exponents are between this interval here of 0.9 and 3.29, respectively uh, 0.39 and uh, 0.51 for the Hurst exponent. Uh, given that the expectation of the power exponent alpha is 2.61, an in, in, in interesting Im implication of that benchmark model is that the variance of variance is undefined. Because the uh, value of the power exponent is below 3. Uh, and, th and this means, in turn, according to Taleb, and uh, he derives this in his book uh, on pre-asymptotics uh, and consequences of pre-asymptotics pre uh, and fair tales, uh, it means that we are not in an environment that allows us to, to work with the variance. Because we do not observe the true value of the variance in finite samples. So in, in another finding or another, let's say, uh, outcome or feature is that um, even if we, because this model tells us, okay, even if we observe a, a, a realized variance series that gives us a power exponent of, let's say, 3.29, we cannot rule out that this is a part of this distribution here. So, again, we cannot reject the null hypothesis that the variance of variance doesn't exist, because it could be uh, a part of, of that model here that generates uh, an expectation or a theoretical expectation of the power exponent that is equal to 2.6. Um, then testing uh, realized weekly variances for the British pound, US dollar exchange rate, Bitcoin, crude oil, S&P 500 shows that the benchmark model is capable of explaining the properties of all of these un otherwise unrelated asset markets variances uh, based upon uh, these two key metrics. And of course, uh, testing the benchmark model uh, using monthly data strongly supports this evidence. So what I, what, what, one thing that also might be interesting for some of you is the finding that Bitcoin uh, has a power law exponent uh, that is larger than the one of the S&P 500. So what actually means is that uh, Bitcoin has, is less prone to extreme events than the S&P 500, right? But we have, to, we have to think, I mean, some, I think some people have uh, their, like a, um, so, so first of all, the thing is that if you, if you see here the, the, the table, the X minimum value is 140, is, is a variance of 143, all right? Whereas the minimum value for the for the for the S and P 500 uh, variance that is governed by the power law process is 2.81. So we are in, in, in this, that's a different universe actually. So the the, uh, the 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 Bitcoin variance or or Bitcoin volatility is already very very high. It's always very very high. S and P 500's volatility or or variance is not always very very high. So the only only 15 15 percent of the sample of, of, of Bitcoin variance is governed by a, by, a, by a power law process, 
whereas almost half of the observations for the S&P 500. So, so this, these are somewhat uh, differences. Yeah. So, so if let's say if, if, if Bitcoin makes a huge jump in, in prices, it shouldn't come. It, it should not come as, as a surprise because it's always it always jumps a lot around in, in prices. So. Uh, that's not the same for the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 drops 29%, uh, that's a huge, huge event. Yeah, and this doesn't happen that often. But in, for, for, for Bitcoin, there's huge variation all the time. So that's, that's maybe, that's maybe ex the explanation for, for why um, uh, the, 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 the figures here suggest maybe somewhat con uh, surprising evidence here. Yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, of course uh, comments are, are very welcome. Um, I uh, conducted uh, yeah, this, this, this study uh, some, some weeks ago and it was long time, uh, it was somewhat, um, um, it's all, this, this whole subject is, is, is quite new for me. Uh, and I, I just started to uh, read about it and um, my, my, my earlier research was, was more, uh, more uh, based upon uh, basically testing the, 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 the power law model for, for, for volatilities or, or realized variances and uh, multi, multifractality uh, I haven't considered at that point in time so but of course you Life is about learning. You always learn something new, and and now I, I'm um, started with 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 this new uh, kind of research. But um, yeah, I mean, your comments are, are very welcome here, <laughs> and. Uh, Yes, please. Yes, thank you also for the presentation. Um, I enjoyed your presentation because it was so detailed and one could follow you very exactly and understand what your analysis exactly is. And um, I have two points. Uh, first, um, as I see you, uh, you are practically analyzing the scaling properties of financial volatility using the realized variances and modeling these properties using the multifractor model of asset returns. And um, it would be my recommendation that you also use the two um, alternative models, the Markov switching mo model of Calvi and Fisher, and maybe also the multifractor random walk model. Um, anyway, there is um, already literature on these models for realized volatilities mentioned in the beginning of your presentation. There are two papers now on multifractal uh, modeling of realized volatilities which should uh, be mentioned um, in your paper or maybe you can also use these models and check for the same properties based on the MSM model or the multifractal random walk model and just compare between the three models. So I, I see now you are just using the, the MMAR of Mandelbrot, but I think it would be interesting to compare with the other two models, which are also more elaborated. Maybe you can compare between the properties you get from the three models, you, something like that. And so this would be um, my idea. And um, the second point is on the realized volatilities that you are using. As you said, you are summing over squared daily returns. Yes, and. Um, as far as I know, um, one should um, use um, intraday data. Um, so one should sum over the squared returns of the intraday data because um, otherwise I think you might lose a lot of information for, from your various estimator by just using the daily data. So I'm not sure about that, but the studies I read, they're, they're always uh, using the high frequency data. And so it might be that your realize volatility, your volatility proxy that you are using is not good enough if you are just starting at the daily scale. So, yes, these are the two comments. Yeah, yeah, thank you for your comments, yeah. Um, 
I, I was wondering uh, for, I mean, if, if it's, um, if I should uh, add more uh, other, other models to that paper already, um, I was wondering, isn't, would it, would, would it be too much for, for one article? Um, or should I leave it for, for, for future research? Um, this is still, uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you, thank you for your, for your comment. Then the second comment realized uh, there are papers, of course, who uh, use the uh, intraday data. Um, usually, it's 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 difficult to to get it for let's say for the for S and P 500. You you there are price range um, estimators which are available. There are different different price range estimators using intraday prices, high and low prices, open and closing prices. Um, and of course, there are papers, certainly papers they, who, that are using uh, tick data. Um, then of course, the, the question is, then you might end up in micro, uh, you have done maybe some micro structure issues. There are also papers that use um, uh, daily returns, the, the simple closing prices and square them uh, in order to compute the realized uh, variance or, or square root of it for the volatility. So there are, of course, different uh, approaches um, using this, this model um, as it is, using the um, MMA, MMAR as the, the foundation for the, the, um, deriving the uh, realized volatilities or the realized variance um, that makes it, of course, uh, difficult or maybe impossible to uh, get the uh, to translate that model into a daily, like a, like like a daily uh, in or in intraday uh, model. But uh, yeah, but 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 thank you, thank you for your for your comments. I, I need to think more here about that. Thank you. If I may expand on that, I was also a bit confused by the use of the term realized variance because that's usually used for intraday aggregation of returns. So I'm not sure whether that would be accepted, but we have to see as a referee of the journal would accept this terminology. It's basically it's the squares of daily returns that you are using. Yeah. And the squares of the multi-factor process yeah. for daily returns yeah. and the aggregates. That's new, the aggregate over one week, over five observations and 20 observations. And I wonder whether that's really a measure of variance. Yeah, as, as Christina said, it's probably very unprecise compared to intraday realized volatility. And I also wonder whether you would expect in terms of the, of the statistics different results for the tail index, which is kind of an unconditional statistics, uh, may, maybe the results should not be too different for returns compared to uh, squared returns, and maybe also not compared to aggregated squared returns. For the Hurst coefficient, certainly, because the dependence becomes uh, more pronounced or less pronounced, and that's the, that was a very interesting, actually, time series feature that I hadn't seen before that you can get uh, anti-correlation in uh, the aggregation of the multi-factor process for some parameter and a positive correlation according to the Hurst coefficient for some other parameter, with the parameters being relatively close by, like 0 0.55, 0 0.6, and 0 0.65. So that's, that's quite interesting to look at. Uh, and that defines kind of an, an interesting um, property with which, which you have used in order to match uh, the empirical data with a particular parameter. For for the Earth, for the uh, for the alpha the, the tail index, I, I think now I remember that I did in two, in a paper I think of 2001 uh, published in Quantitative Finance. I did estimation of the tail index for the simulated returns from the MMAR, and I I think I got something in the vicinity of three as well. And I think that I also quote the theoretical results that I mentioned before in this paper. So after the talk, I will try to find it in my files. And if I have an electronic file and if my memory is right uh, about what I did in this paper, I will send it to you. Yeah, this, some, some this would be great. 
Yeah, this would be great. Yeah, very, very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then I have, an, I have an, another question. Uh, would you mind, because I, the, the University of Barca has access to uh, applied economics, um, and I tried to download your study from 96, where you, I think you, you were um, investigating the properties of German stocks for the uh, DAX 30 yeah, yeah. and using extreme, extreme value theory. And I was wondering, because I, I cannot access uh, financial. I can send you a copy of that as well. I think I have an electronic copy. Oh, this would be great. I would be very thankful. Yeah, I, I wanted to read it over the years ago, but I couldn't get it in the internet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Other questions? Then. Yeah, so the information was perfect, but there's looks who have some questions. Yes. Uh, maybe, maybe more last last add on, uh, since I'm not so much into the topic, but it was nice for me since that you concentrated on one model that made it a bit easier for me to follow. Uh, but I was wondering that in the last table that you had, where you basically had mostly indices and comparing it to a single cryptocurrency, so maybe it would have made sense to also choose like cryptocurrency index, although probably Bitcoin will make up 30%, 40% of such an index, so maybe that wouldn't change that much, but maybe we can then get around uh, this quite large X-min values for the power law of things, because that would then maybe spread a bit more depending on which one you take, but when you already did it, and Obviously, it makes a bit more sense to present the Bitcoin result because that's more interesting to anyone who's looking at it at first glance. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, there are, of course, uh, I was thinking about uh, the, uh, the, the Bitcoin or should I use a basket of, of, of cryptocurrencies, but the problem is, of course, that Bitcoin has a very, um, is, is the cryptocurrency that has the longest uh, time span and if, uh, and um, there are not so many, actually, I, I read once a paper um, and we were showing that 60% uh, of all cryptocurrencies end up in, in default after, with, within a four year period. Uh, so um, it's, it's tricky, tricky to get, let's say, um, sufficient data for, the, I think there, there, are, there, may, there are some indices, crypto indices, but they start in 2000 and I don't know, 16 or so there's there's not much data available so far unfortunately but uh, yeah but 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 thank you for the comment i i might think about it in more detail yeah thank you So the profession is too concerned 
but in too much kind of things to its established ways of, of modeling. Yeah. I'm happy to see that there's also in Barca somebody uh, who is uh, kind of advancing this research. Yeah, I, of course, uh, I, I think that, um, I mean, you are, you are right, I fully agree, I fully agree. I, after what I read now, so far, I, I, I'm wondering the same thing. Um, but after... I can't hear you anymore, so somehow it's too, your voice is too low at the moment. Okay, okay, so maybe the internet connection, is it now better? Now it's better, yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm fully agree on that issue, and I was, I was also thinking about that. And um, I think after I read the book from from Mandelbrot, his his last book from 2008, it, it seems to be that uh, in finance, especially in in finance, there is a certain lobby, and uh, unfortunately, um, who. For instance, Eugene Farmer was a doctoral student from Mandelbrot. He knew about that since '63, um, but he followed a different stream of research, following Markowitz, Sharp, and of course he won the Nobel Prize 2013. And in one of my papers, I showed that his uh, his three-factor model is sample-specific. Uh, but well. I think it has a lobby um, who has certain interests, and um, Mandelbrot should have. Uh, I think he should have won the Nobel Prize. Uh, I think he's he's a, he's a genius, and not he, he has not not only impacted uh, economics but also uh, mathematics, and uh, it's it's yeah. You're completely gone. It's sorry. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, but. Uh, yeah, I think there was some, uh, at some point there was discussion about Mandelbrot getting the Nobel Prize. He was a serious candidate, but then he didn't do any research anymore in economics for a long time. And then, of course, he would have been a strange choice in, in, the, in the late 80s or beginning 90s before he came back at the end of the 90s with his multifactor model. But he was quite an interesting character. I met him a few times at okay. conferences. Wow. So I was once uh, even allowed to give a speech in his honor. That was one of the, but it was one of the trillion conferences to honor his 80th birthday. So I was not the only one, but I was one of them from South so who could give a speech in his honor. <laughs> wow. He was really, really very popular. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Wow. And amazingly. Well known in the general public. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And keep in touch. Yes, we do. Nice time. And Th enjoy the midsummer night in the <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.